I'm going to go on. The next part of this module is frameworks. So deep learning frameworks, right, they help us actually build our deep learning models. I like to think of them as uh, living on like a two axis, you know, landscape. There are some that are good for production, but maybe not good for development, and then some that are good for development, maybe not good for production, and maybe there's some that are good for both, right? So um, in 2013, uh, CAFE was written here in Berkeley, actually on the seventh floor of this building, and um, by my lab mates. And uh, it was based in C++. If you wanted to contribute a new layer type to CAFE, you had to write it in C++. You had to write the backward, uh, uh, the backward step yourself, so you had to like, you know, differentiate your forward and then write it in C++, contribute all of that. So it was not good for development. Like you couldn't easily contribute a new layer type. You couldn't easily connect different weird graphs. But it was very good for production because it's in C++. It just runs you know, as fast as possible, calls out to CUDA. Everything is very fast. TensorFlow came out in 2015. And the TensorFlow method, uh, originally when it came out, was to basically describe in code the static graph that would run your computation, which is also not good for development because it, it's like this metaprogramming way of writing your deep learning um, model. You're basically describing, you're not coding what happens, you're kind of describing the graph by which things will happen. And that's just one level of indirection. It's kind of hard to think about. So it's still very good because the Google team put a lot of effort into making sure it runs on all kinds of hardware. Uh, but it's not very good for development in 2015. Keras is uh, um, basically a thing on top of TensorFlow as well as some other deep learning libraries like Theano. But it made it a lot better to actually develop deep learning models because it had this cool, uh, you know, you, you just basically wrote, you know, flatten of this and uh, the graph was basically written for you. You just wrote some lines and that it was a much better experience actually declaring what your model looked like. Uh, PyTorch came out in 2017, and it explicitly made it its goal to be good for development. So you can basically write Python code, and the forward pass actually just executes your Python code. So if there's a mistake somewhere, you can put a breakpoint in your Python code and be in the middle of like your deep learning code like using the Python debugging tools, which is very hard to do in TensorFlow. Um, but people were worried that it wouldn't be good for production because it was executing this Python code path. Um, so the first thing I want to say is like TensorFlow uh, with Keras or PyTorch are like clearly the two options. Uh, nothing else really, I think, makes sense to, to start with unless you have a very good reason to. And I think they're both actually converging to the same point which is TensorFlow uh, with TensorFlow 2.0 added this eager execution mode, which is basically the way PyTorch is, which is that you write your Python code, you execute it, and then in the process of executing it, it builds the graph that it can then optimize. And PyTorch is converging to the same point by adding this optimized execution graph, uh, called, which is basically TorchScript. So you can write your model in Python and then should be easy to convert to Torch script, which is then this optimized execution graph, which can run on even mobile or just constrained resource systems. <coughs> Today, I think most new projects start with PyTorch instead of TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow 2.0 is a release that just happened, I think, last month. Um, and there's a little bit of an upgrade path. So if you upgrade your TensorFlow 1.x models to 2.0, you have to do a little bit of work. Um, so maybe if you're starting a new project, TensorFlow 2.0 makes sense, but I think most people are now using PyTorch. FastAI is a library that is uh, a bunch of code for training specifically, so not necessarily writing the models, but training the models, finding the learning rate, and then also providing a lot of kind of out of the box good models that you can start with for PyTorch specifically. And I think it's actually worth starting with for baked in immediate you know, best practices. And then you can diverge from that if you see a reason to. So PyTorch dominates new development, like I said. Here's a little proof of that. Uh, a publication called The Gradient published this. So they just analyzed like percentage of papers that mention 
uh, PyTorch and not TensorFlow in these machine learning academic conferences. And it's pretty unmistakable. I mean, it went from you know, 0% to almost 80% in just a couple of years. TensorFlow and Keras still lead job posts. I wasn't able to find information from 2019, but I suspect it's actually still similar. So most job posts are still kind of trailing behind a little bit, the, the research workflow. So I want to talk about distributed training, and then I'll pause for questions. So distributed training is the idea that you can use multiple GPUs, or maybe even multiple machines with multiple GPUs, to train a single model. So as opposed to tr running multiple experiments, you run one experiment, but using multiple GPUs. This is more complex than actually just launching an experiment per GPU. But it makes sense if you want to reduce your iteration time. And it especially makes sense if your data set or your model is, is large. So there's two ways to do distributed training. One is called data parallel, and the other is called model parallel. So data parallel um, would be the first recommendation. And if your iteration time, so like to go through the whole data set with your model, if that takes an uncomfortably long period of time, you have having trouble actually learning anything about your model, then you should try training in data parallel. And the way it works is you basically just partition your each, um, so let's say your batch size is 64 and you have four GPUs. So you could actually take the first eight, put it on the first GPU, the second eight, put it on the second GPU, or 16, sorry. Um, such that the, the batch is distributed over the GPUs. Um, the GPUs all have the same weight, and after they run backprop through that batch, they will sync up and all update their weights together. So the weights are always tied on all the GPUs, but the data that each GPU sees is a little different um, each iteration. And it's almost a linear speed up, up to some limit, so for convolutional networks specifically, you can expect 2x basically speed up for two GPUs versus one, and a 3.5x for four GPUs. So it's not quite linear, but for two GPUs it basically is. Lambda Labs provides more support for this claim. Um, they averaged over like all the standard convolutional networks and uh, on a Titan V here. And so for eight GPUs, they saw a 5.2 increase for four GPUs, they saw a 3.2 increase. Model parallelism is uh, necessary when your model doesn't fit in the memory of a single GPU. And so there, you actually break up the graph of your model such that some of the weights live on one GPU, some of the weights live on another GPU, and so on. So you partition the model state over the GPUs. This, as you can imagine, is a lot more complicated. And um, I would say it's probably not worth it unless you really need it. So unless your model is so large that it definitely doesn't fit. But I would still try to just gain access to the largest GPU RAM that you can and try to avoid it. So implementing data parallel in TensorFlow uh, can actually be quite easy. So there's the TF distribute mirrored strategy. And with, this is TensorFlow. I actually think this is 1.14 uh, also but definitely 2.0. Um, so Keras has been kind of converged on as the way to interact with TensorFlow in general. So all you have to do is basically declare your Keras model inside of the strategy scope. And then if you do that, then TensorFlow should actually remember that all the weights are synced. And if you give it a batch, it'll automatically split the batch over the multiple GPUs. Same with PyTorch, um, can also be quite easy. So with PyTorch, you would use an n.data parallel, and you just wrap your model in that. And then once again, uh, you send your model to the first device that you have, but behind the scenes, PyTorch remembers that it's actually distributed over all the GPUs that you have, and it'll sync the weights and spread each batch over the GPUs. So here's, um, it's probably too small to see, but basically, it just says, like, like, in the training loop, I think my batch size is 30. But inside of PyTorch code, it actually only sees 15. And that's because it was distributed over the two GPUs and automatically got split. So if you want to spread your um, training over multiple machines and not just multiple GPUs on a single machine, or if you want to make it work with model parallel, um, there's a thing called data parallel, uh, like, yeah, and then dot 
parallel or and then that distrib or what is it PyTorch that distributed that data parallel, and that gets a lot more complicated because now you have to have like a model parameter server, and if you're over multiple machines, you have to actually log into each one, and start the distributed like process. They all talk to the same server, so it gets a little more complicated. Um, I want to call out a project called Ray, which actually also got started at Berkeley. But Ray is an open source project which makes, just generally, their goal is to make stateful distributed computing very easy, in Python specifically. And for deep learning, they make distributed training on multiple machines uh, easier than, than with native strategies. So Ray is definitely worth a look. Um, this is about deep learning, but if you're doing like other kind of distributed computation, not necessarily using a deep learning framework, Ray is definitely something to look into because it makes it very easy to hold state over distributed machines. And then there's a project called Horovod from uh, Uber, which is a distributed training framework, TensorFlow, and Keras, and PyTorch, and their big innovation, uh, this came out a few years ago. At that time, TensorFlow Distributed was a very complicated beast, and it used this spe special TensorFlow parameter server, which was very finicky. But Horovod just used, a, used uh, MPI, which is the standard multi-process communication framework, and uh, apparently it's a lot easier. I haven't personally used it, but people have reported that it's a much easier experience if you must go to multiple machines. Do you guys have any questions? So the first question is, um, when training, um, I found myself more bottlenecked by loading my data um, you know, when I have really large training data into GPU memory, are there any good resources and best practices for how to set up data loading? The frameworks make data loading uh, classes available to you. So TensorFlow has TF record, which um, you know, it exists to kind of solve this problem, and PyTorch has their kind of data loader class. So if you work within the framework that they provide for you. I mean, that's kind of the best you can do that I know of. So for example, TF record uh, will automatically split up your data over multiple files if, if the data is too large to fit kind of in, in a single place. So yeah, my advice would be like, depending on what framework you're using, just look at, try to work with their data code as much as possible. Yeah, and then um, in TensorFlow specifically, the tf.data um, uh, API is very, um, it's really hard to use, like it's not very well documented and it's um, a little bit finicky, but it's actually very powerful. And so a lot of, like a lot of the name of the game for making fast data pipelines is just figuring out like when you, um, like prefetching stuff from disk or from um, uh, like Google Cloud Storage at the right time and then making sure it's preloaded onto the GPU, um, bef like when you're done training on the previous batch so you don't have to spend a lot of time transferring data between um, you know, disk and memory and memory and GPU memory. And so um, optimizing that is like, it's a bit of trial and error, but the tf.data um, tools give you the right primitives for doing that. Um, so another question, um, are you familiar with VMware and the tools there? Uh, virtual machines? VMware, like VMware specifically. I don't know of anything deep learning specific from VMware. OK. Um, so for TensorFlow versus um, PyTorch, how do GPU memory footprints compare between them, um, like given, like, let's say that you have the same architecture and the same data? That's a good question that I don't really know the answer to. And I think it would depend on the exact model that you have. But I don't think it would be different. There's nothing like. I don't think there's anything different between TensorFlow and PyTorch that will make it radically different. You know, at the end of the day, you have your number of parameters. You have 20 million parameters. They're all float 32s. They have to live somewhere. It's going to be the same between PyTorch and TensorFlow. The efficiency might be a tiny bit different between them, but I don't know enough to say. What is the state of federated training in practice? What is federated training in practice? Who asked that question? Maybe it could be, could be a yeah. remote. Uh, it's about uh, training your model models on each machine and then using buses and uh, aggregating. Oh, so maybe, so maybe federated training is 
the no one ever sees the full data set. It's always like maybe for privacy reasons. Um, it's more like training your model on edge. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, I don't know much about it, and yeah, that's a good question though. And if people know, please post in Slack. Um, do you see distributed training used a lot in startups? I think more, like more so recently than before because the framework makers keep making it easier and easier to do. Like TensorFlow, when it first came out in 2015, it was very difficult to do any kind of distributed training. But now it's literally potentially a one-line change. So it makes a lot of sense to, to give it a try. Um, especially <clears throat> it's, not lin it's not linear, right? So with eight GPUs, you only see 5x improvement in speed. So it might not, not make sense to go to eight GPUs, but with two GPUs, you see 1.9 improvement in speed. And so to me, that probably makes sense. So if you, if you can train your model twice as fast and you already have the two GPUs and it's super easy, then I think it makes a lot of sense. What is the single biggest benefit of setting up all this in infrastructure for resource management and task distribution versus just using something like SageMaker? So that's a good segue maybe to the next thing. Um, so at the top there is the all-in-one. So that would be stuff like SageMaker. So we're going to get to it in the next 15 minutes. 